Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 37 of Both Laugh, the Dying Scene Quarantine Chat Show. As always, I am the host, Jay Stone. And uh, to say that I've been looking forward to today's episode for many, many years is to put it mildly, um, because today's guest perfectly represents my two lifelong passions. Uh, you guys might know him as a founding member of 10 Foot Pole and Pulley, uh, where he's got one of the most distinct, in my mind, voices in punk rock. Uh, you might know him as the Chicago White Sox third round draft pick in 1986, uh, where he went on to compile a big league record of 42 and 25 uh, with 52 saves and was the winner of the 1995 Tony Canigliero Award, which is a big deal. Ladies and germs, Mr. Scott Radinsky, welcome to the show. Thanks for doing this. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's uh, if there's like I was saying before we started recording, if there's one thing that I'm as big a dork about for punk rock, it's baseball. And baseball sort of allows you to, to do that. <laughs> and it's funny, I've, I've, read, I've read an awful lot of interviews with you over the years because of your sort of unique spot in both worlds. Uh, and it seems like the baseball people always talk to you like the punk rock thing is like this weird mystical thing. And then the punk rock people always talk to you like baseball is this weird mystical thing. And it was like, no way, this is awesome. I get to do both. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, it's especially years ago, it was kind of like almost taboo, but right. yeah. Yeah. There weren't many punk rockers in baseball. There weren't many rockers in general. I think when you think baseball, it's like country and good old boys and pickup trucks and stuff like that, especially the last, I don't know, 20, 25 years or so. Um, but there weren't many punk rockers in baseball, were there? Uh, no, there wasn't hardly any at all. Um, I think over the course of my whole 30 some odd years in professional baseball, I might've met one or two guys, but yeah, very far few between. Um, I don't know when I first started, it was like what you were saying. It was a lot of hillbillies with that yeah. stereotype, you know, oh, kill your mom, kill your dad. And it's like, yeah, yeah, that's what it's, that's what it's about. But, right. Um, yeah, no, not, not too many. There's a few rock and roll guys, Blackjack McDowell, for example. Uh, but he, he was considered like the rock and roll guy of baseball, like the one. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a few guys, I think, that played guitar, um, you know, that did things. Uh, Bronson Arroyo, Bronson Arroyo uh, sure. you know, Bertie, Bertie Williams. And I can remember a guy with the Expos. I can't remember what his name was, but he was a pitcher. And I remember going to the old Olympic Stadium once getting off the, uh, we would take the, uh, I guess it's like their subway there. Uh, from the hotel to the baseball field because it went right underneath the stadium right and, and uh so i was taking it after a game after a saturday day game or something back to the hotel and and he was up there you know having a jam in the concourse area i can't remember the guy's name but there's there's been a few that you know play and i, I guess claim mu musicianship that that old expo stadium i was lucky enough or maybe lucky is the wrong word uh but lucky enough to go there for a game once and it was the first game back after 9-11 uh it was expos marlins oh, wow uh, i think so on the we watched the the uh news when we got home 937 was the crowd in the stadium that night and wow. th like there were some good players on those like late 90s early 2000s expos teams vlad guerrero of course but uh, oh, yeah. nobody was there we walked up and bought tickets 15 minutes before the game, eight rows behind home plate for like $15 American or something like that. It was wow. sad, but also awesome. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, does it get any better than that? Um, there, there was always a kind of sporadic, sparse type crowds there. It was, it was a cool ballpark. Um, I remember one year the roof was broken and they had it open. And, oh, wow. and, and, that, and that made it pretty cool to go in as a visitor. And, you know, it was, you know, summertime in Montreal, it was nice out. And so it was sunny and and it's just cool to be outdoors. Um, you know, the indoor baseball vibe was always weird. And, yeah. and in that, that big cavernous uh, dome, it was, it was, had a weird echo to it. But, but I remember going there, like I said, for a series where it was open and it was, it was, it was fun, a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine. Um, yeah. So what I normally start talking with is about, because we started doing this show really just about a year ago um, at the beginning of quarantine, because I used to do a lot of live photography and obviously you couldn't do live photography anymore. And our actual, the dying scene website itself kind of shit the bed a uh, little over a year ago. So I couldn't really do print interviews anymore. I said, well, got to do something to keep connected with people during quarantine. But it really started as like checking in with people about 
what they were doing. Um, and what would what would 2020 have looked like for you if we didn't end up getting shut down? What did you have on the radar in terms of police stuff or in terms of baseball stuff that had to go by the wayside? Um, I actually had a lot of good stuff on, on both ends. Uh, you know, as far as the band went, uh, the police stuff, we had a lot of uh, really cool live stuff, uh, you know, tours like every band, um, a lot of stuff over the summer that was in Europe, some festivals, uh, a, f a few good dates with Bad Religion through Spain, just a, a good a good tour run there. We had a festival in Canada we were going to play called the Red Bridge Fest. Um, just a few different things that that kind of all fell to the to the postponement there, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, uh, of of everything. Um, you know, baseball wise, I had a I had some stuff. I've been working with Team USA the last couple of years, so I had some. Uh, they have a player development pipeline. A lot of younger kids that that. Uh, before they get into college, it's like a national team. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all top prospects in the country. It was a partnership with MLB. It was pretty cool. I did it the year before uh, down in Florida and was going to do it again last year. Um, so yeah, I mean, basically the two things that I do were uh, were put on hold and, and 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 did have some cool things lined up, but unfortunately, they're uh, they're on pause until what's looking like probably now another summer, which is 2022. How quickly did it sort of dawn on you that uh, this wasn't going to be? Because I know for us at least, it seemed like things were going to be canceled for like two weeks. That was sort of the big thing, like everybody stay home for two weeks and let's get through this, and then you know maybe over the summer uh, things will open up, and then obviously by May it was like well maybe in the fall things will open up, and then by the summer it was like well maybe in the winter so it just kept getting yeah the can kept getting kicked down the road but how quickly into lockdown did you guys start to actually cancel stuff and and just like indefinitely postpone stuff um we had a a show here book locally it was sometime in march it was a local scene here we we call it nardcore yeah. I don't know if old 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 folks that are familiar with the mystic uh, record thing, uh, but anyway, they were doing a at a bowling alley. It was like a a, a festival, like uh, in a bowling alley, and it was somewhere around mid March. And I think it was the day or two before the gig. The promoter said a couple of bands had had uh, taken themselves out. The whole COVID thing was just kind of starting to surface a little bit. There was still a lot of unknown. You know, you heard talk about it, but you didn't know what was going on, and so. I want to say it was the day before and there was going to be like one band that was going to play and the rest of the guys in my band said, ah, we don't want to play. Yeah. It's not going to be any good. And so we canceled that. And I think somewhere within a two week period for me personally, somewhere around the first of April, I know when like the NBA shut down and then right. MLB shut down. That for me was like, okay, for those type of money making corporations to shut down mid season, right. this is for real. This is real, and um, I, I'm an I'm an optimist for sure. I, I like to be positive, um, but I also have a pretty good feel on my gut. Yeah, yeah. and and um, I, I just felt like somewhere in April, I was like, well, we're not doing anything this summer. And yeah. the word I was getting over in Europe, which is where we had stuff booked wasn't looking too good and they were trying to postpone till the fall and then I started thinking to myself somewhere around mid-April like this is this is a wash and um and we started focusing on 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 basically on 2021 and and um <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> most of that turned into a wash as well and right. like I said not not trying to be the pessimist but but even early this year, I had my doubts about this summer. I, I just, as, as much as things got postponed and there was all this optimism and vaccinations and everything, it's still going to take a long time for, for things to get back to normal, especially in, in what we do. You know, we're not a sit down theater type, uh, right. you know, out, you know, band and or playing outdoors. So, you know, to get into a small, sweaty, grimy club, it, it's going to take a while for, uh, for us to get back on stage, I think. Yeah, we picked the wrong scene. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. I, yeah, the, for sure. The right scene uh, for those of us that are involved in it, but the wrong scene for something like this because you you're right. You can't socially distance a punk rock show. It just like, it's you know we did a we did a uh, last June we did a uh, it was awesome. We did a drive-in show in a parking lot. Oh, how was that? It, 
it was killer. Uh, yeah. It was in Ox. It was in Oxnard out by the beach. It was a, it was a cool night. Um, so everybody parked their cars. They had these designated spots, but then they allowed people to get out of their cars and hang out in chairs. And like some people had little barbecues going. And you were free to roam around uh, if you had a mask on. They weren't. It wasn't like Nazi police yeah, yeah, right. policing it. It was it was pretty casual. And I think in Ventura County, it was a little more laid back than LA County anyway, but uh, people were totally civil and they were, they were, you know, uh, respectful of, of each other. And I thought it was, you're used to having people up close to you. And I yeah. thought it was really, really cool to play to like this atmosphere of, you know, like people that were just sitting there enjoying the music and, and we weren't like focusing on, you know, as much a stage show, as much as maybe sounding good. And uh, I, I had a great time. I thought it was a lot of fun. It was different, but it was yeah. a lot of fun. I was going to yeah. say, that's, I mean, punk rock sort of thrives on the band feeding off the audience and, and vice versa, obviously. But so mm -hmm. it's got to be weird when the audience is that far away from you and, and sitting in lawn chairs and stuff like that. I would go in a heartbeat if anybody good was doing that around here, just that they're not. Um, but I, yeah. but it's, it's, it does make for a different dynamic at a punk rock show, I would imagine. Yeah, it was like I said. It was it was really cool. It was yeah. different, yeah. but it was cool to see a lot of friends because you know we had all been what had been close to six months at that point where no one had really done anything. Right. So uh, so it was cool to kind of be able to see people and and you know people did like I said they kept their distance they wore their masks but it was just nice to be outside and and, and enjoy some music and regardless of uh, whether you could get into it physically or not it yeah. was it was it was there you know, for the, for the audio version. And it was, it was a lot of fun and we had a lot of fun too. When did you guys sort of pivot from, okay, now we know that we're not going to play shows this year. Let's work on music. Let's work on, and we'll, we'll talk about different strings, which I think is a really cool uh, project that you guys have coming out. But when did that sort of pivot happen to realize, okay, we got to do some different things now. Um, well, both both of the other guitar players uh, have full time jobs, and I guess it would have been probably somewhere around April ish that they were uh, they were kind of put on hold like the rest of the world. And we, we've had a studio here that we've rehearsed in for God close to thirty years now, and I, I play drums when we write music. So the three of us were getting in the studio, and we had been working on new songs and. And this kind of accelerated that and gave us the opportunity to, to kind of hammer out a, I guess, what's going to be a new record down the road. And probably did about 14, 15, 16 songs over the course of a, a few weeks. And then uh, we were uh, we were asked to do a, a, an acoustic thing. Or actually what we did was we came up with something we wanted to do on our own, which was we were going to do an acoustic series of each record that we've done. So we picked a, a few songs off the first record. And we started started recording those acoustically and kind of figuring them out a little bit, arranging them, and and I thought it was cool, something different. We had talked about it back in, uh, I want to say it was 2003. We were getting ready to record our our last record. We did an epitaph called Matters, and, right. and we were gonna we were gonna do about four or five acoustic songs, and they just never saw the light of day. I don't know if it was timing in the studio or or, or how it worked, but we'd always had that idea. So. Uh, I guess, like I said, in April, we were, we were writing new songs, recording new songs, kind of, I don't want to say we got the album done because it's never done until you finish it, but, <laughs> right. but, uh, but we did a lot of writing. We probably did like 95% of the writing. We got a bulk of it done over the course of a month or so. And then, and then we wanted to start this other project and do this, uh, this acoustic series. So, uh, that's kind of how that came about. And then we did a couple of live streams acoustically, which was fun. Um, we did another live stream that was, uh, you know, the full band, which was fun. But uh, I, I guess it would have been early, early in the quarantine when we when we took advantage, guys were out of work. And uh, we just took advantage of going and spending our day at the studio. We could show up at noon and, you know, spend three, four hours and hammer out a song or two and then show up a day or two later and do the same thing. So we got a lot accomplished uh, April, May, and June of, of last last summer, last is spring. That, is that how writing normally works for you guys? Uh, or is that <laughs> did that sort of allow you to come together and write more or differently than normal because everybody sort of had the time now? 
uh, for, to have that many members, uh, yeah. to have the time. Yeah, it was, it was definitely, uh, it was different. Um, a lot of times, uh, our guitar player, Mike and myself will, we'll do a lot of the writing, both musically and lyrically. And, um, and then, you know, we bring it to the studio and the rest of the guys throw in their parts. We kind of arrange a song from there, but, you know, we'll have a little bit of a foundation. Um, sometimes someone will come up with a song completely on their own, walk in and go, Hey, check out what I have. And, and um, it, I mean, it's, it, it, it's varied, but, but this was a, an opportunity for, for us, I guess, to have more of a consistent flow where we knew we were going a few times a week. We almost had like a, a weekly schedule and a time yeah. and, and it was cool. It was like, not a job, but it was like, it was an outlet because we didn't have anything else going on. So it was cool. It's good to have that relationship 25 years into a band too. <laughs> that you, you like being around each other enough to get together and write a few times a week. You know, we've always joked about that. I, I think the, the, the way our bands existed and, and, and um, not that we haven't taken it serious because we have, but we haven't really ever been a full-time touring type band. I, f I feel we've been a full-time band that's continued to put out music and, and play shows, you know, on an annual basis, but it's never really been our livelihood. And I don't think we, we, sh we started out with that, that, uh, that goal. So we've always remained friends. We were friends before the band and, and, you know, everybody has their differences. Sure. And when you get to when you get together for long periods of time, maybe uh, nerves wear thin a little bit on each other. But I'd say for the most part, we, we've been very fortunate. Like if you see us at a, at a gig backstage, we're hanging out together, having fun. Uh, we play with a ton of bands where there's, you know, four or five guys kind of go in their own direction just because they've had enough of each other. And so we always kind of laugh at that. Like we're, we're like the band that actually likes each other. <laughs> Yeah, that that's a punk rock sort of has this ethos about a brotherhood and family and whatever. And and so when you're on the outside looking in, that's sort of the impression that everybody loves each other and it's all bros all the time. And then the more people you get to know that play in bands, you're like, oh, that's not exactly the way it is at all for a lot of people. And there's a lot of people that are really good together creatively and on stage and in the studio and stuff. But then personally, they're like polar opposites some really good and well-known bands are very like that so i like that you guys have that that thing still yeah yeah for sure um you know like i said we were friends before and right. and uh and and we just happened to be able to write music together and and we're able to exist as friends together and and uh you know we still don't take things too seriously and, and we just continue to have fun with it and you know everybody started out in the garage doing it for the, for the reason and the passion of playing music. And for some, unfortunately, it, or fortunately, it turns into a, a job and who the hell likes any job, you know, any job you do is, is going to, is going to have its, is going to have its ups and downs. So, um, you know, yeah, we're, I think that's going to continue to be our approach as, as, as we move, as we go on for the rest of our existence. And regardless of how friendly you are, you put enough guys in a small enough van for uh, a long enough period of time and tempers are going <laughs> to spike because people's oh, no feet doubt. smell and asses smell and yeah you know, this one drives like shit and this one yeah, drinking too much and da, 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 da. so oh, that stuff's no, always no going to happen for sure and and like you said uh, you'd be surprised how often it does happen you know being in a band is not an easy thing being in a band trying to make a living is certainly not an easy thing and then being in a band trying to make a living being on the road all the time it's like you put it's just it's a recipe for disaster and, and there's a lot of uh there's a lot of uh, emotions that get get thrown around over the course of tours and, and band members and and uh, it's tough man i don't i don't envy that at all it's it's really hard um so let's talk about like i said a little bit ago let's talk about different strings the uh the acoustic 10 inch, I guess it officially is, uh, that's coming out, I think at the end of this month, if I have my timeline right. So that's that's the first of this series of hopefully stripped down acoustic renditions of stuff from previous albums, right? Um, yeah, if the, uh, if the plan goes, or if it goes as planned, um, you know, we were gonna pick three, four songs off each record and we've kind of identified the songs we were gonna do. Um, like I said, we were really getting into it at one point, and then 
at some point later in the summer, last last summer, things kind of started opening up. Those guys started going back to work. Um, there was being less time devoted to it. We never got to the second record, but but we do, like I said, we did identify the songs for the second and the third and the fourth record, the songs we'd use. Um, and then other things started happening. Um, we started getting involved in re-releasing uh, other other records that had never been put out on vinyl. We released a couple couple of records through a company in Canada, um, and then and then the uh, the acoustic thing came, and we're going to release that with Spam. And um, I would like to think that we will accomplish what we wanted to do, and 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 knock out the other the other records. It's just a matter of time now. When you say you identified the songs on the other records um, to try to do acoustically, have you played around with acoustic? I mean, I, I don't know of you guys to have played acoustically really at all um, in what I know of your career, but have, have you played around with a lot of those songs either amongst yourselves or is that just kind of going by what you think will fit or? Uh, well, a lot of the songs are, are are written acoustically to begin with. Okay. Um, and when I say identify, it's like some of them are impossible to play yeah. acoustic, acoustically. You know, it's just bar chords thrashing throughout the fretboard and it's yeah. just it's hammered away. Um, but so the ones that like don't have a whole lot of like funky picking and they can be played acoustically, not necessarily all the same style, but uh, you know, with, you know, real chords and everything, but but just uh, that, that have a better flow to them. and and than others and and some of the songs we want to do we try but but they just they're just not acoustic songs you know and and, and unfortunately you can't play every song acoustically no and and as a band we've we've really never done it um on stage or live uh, like i said we've done a couple of these live streams here recently but just with uh select songs we've, we've actually done a whole set of, of acoustic stuff um a couple live streams yeah but there are there certain songs we couldn't use without like drastically rearranging them essentially uh, just they just wouldn't sound good it would just be just kind of wailing over on acoustic guitar just yeah. it, it, you know it doesn't, doesn't sound as well so you know we try to put a little different spin on them and, and and give them a little bit more of a mellower uh vibe to it where you can actually sing over it so not every song allows you to do that does it change the way you approach singing where you don't have like the the four on the floor like everything cranked to 11 behind you so you have to do a little bit different vocally it was uh super challenging when i when i when we recorded the first few songs um you know we we all have like our own little home studios so the guys would you know do their guitar stuff and then i was trying to do the vocals and and um i recorded in my closet in my bedroom and um i, I just remember being in there going jesus I can't sing. Like <laughs> I, I'm not a singer. I've been screaming for right. thirty something years, and 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 uh, it was a challenge. But then once I kind of got into the groove and figured a few things out, it became a lot of fun. And, and uh, I don't want to say it was easy, but it's actually a little easier than than singing full force. You know, like you said, crank to eleven, yeah. everything behind you. It's 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 tough to keep up with that at that pace sometimes. And so once I, like I said, once I kind of got the phrasing and I kind of learned how to space out the words and, 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 and where to, you know, hit certain notes, the challenge became fun. And, and I, I kind of enjoyed it. I, I looked forward to going in and, and, and doing more songs because it, it was, like I said, it's a, it's a different type of challenge and yeah, it's yeah. fun and it allows you to kind of be a different singer, you know, find, find parts of myself that I didn't really know existed, challenge myself. Like you said, you've been a front man for 30 years, but now you have to be a singer. <laughs> it's, exactly. it's different. Yeah, it's different. Um, let's, what was the last show you guys played? How, how close to the end of, uh, or how close to the beginning of everything locking down were you guys playing shows? Uh, we played a show in January with a band okay. called Youth, Youth Brigade. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, and then... Uh, it was some time in January, it might've been late January. And then we had this other show that was booked in March, which didn't happen. And um, so, yeah, I guess it would have been sometime in January. So is this, by the time you guys, well, I guess you did play a show last summer, the sit down show, but will this effectively be the longest you've gone once you actually are able to get back out on the road 
without playing? I know you've sort of been off and on the road, but it's been pretty regular. Will this be the longest period of time you've gone without really playing live in front of people? Uh, for me personally, yeah, it would be the longest period of time I've gone since proof 1983, maybe. That's wild. Yeah, I mean, I've had obviously spurts where it's been six, eight, nine months at times, but right. uh, I've, I've, you know, it's been a consistent thing throughout the years where, you know, at least a handful of shows every year we would play doing something. So uh, to not play live, I mean, it, I guess we played in June that last June, we played that drive-in show. Right. Um, yeah, we're approaching a year. It's definitely the longest period of time for me in, in, in my life. You played the, was it Monsters of Rock or something like that? The live stream, maybe, I don't know, mm -hmm. October, November is what sticks out in my head. But honestly, the whole last year kind of blends together for me. Anyway, I don't remember when it was, but is that a, yeah, that, that's was, got, that was in June. Oh, was it really? Yeah, it was June 12th. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's got to be a different sort of experience too, just sort of playing a live stream as a full band, but by yourselves. It was really weird. Uh, and. and you know, playing wasn't wasn't really the strange part. It was when we were done with a yeah, song. Yeah. There was no there was no heckling. There was no you know, hey, you suck or right. turn it up. Right. There was no clapping. There was nothing. So that was the strange thing was to finish a song and then like, okay, now what do we do? And uh, you know, we just wanted to just make it a forty five minute wall of music, just blast through all the songs and then be done. Um, but uh, it was cool. I mean, it it sounded amazing. In this, it sounded great. You know, yeah in this place we were at, I mean, for us to play live, most of the, I mean, a lot of the venues, they sound okay. They don't sound great, but this yeah. was like an actual studio that was set up for this. And yeah, it sounded amazing. It was great for yeah. us. The experience for us on stage was, was good. Yeah. It, you had a, a lot of cool visual stuff and not a lot of people have done that. I've obviously, I'm sort of live streamed out at this point because I've watched yeah. so many of them, but you, you guys had sort of that boxed in and there's visuals sort of everywhere that not really a lot of people do. That was a, that was a cool sort of uh, twist on the live stream thing. I haven't seen that very much. Yeah, that was cool. They had, I don't know where they got them, but I know those Monsters Rock people were connected with all kinds of companies donating different things. And they had this computerized, like, I guess it would be a lighting type thing yeah. there were there were these walls behind us and the stage was the same it was all glass and so they asked us for graphics and and we sent them a couple of songs and i guess their you know their video guy he used some of our graphics but then he you know listened to some of our music and said okay well i i, I gotta get some fast paced type stuff and they had some like, car racing and yeah, some cool yeah. skateboarding stuff and so yeah they did a really good job and it was and it was cool for us while we were playing to actually kind of have that vibe around us it was you know you weren't you weren't bored right. staring at nothing it was like there was like visual for us as well so it was cool right so even though there's not necessarily people in front of you giving you feedback you kind of have at least your senses are still a little like uh, a little stimulated energy, yeah. yeah right yeah yeah um to go back to the nardcore thing because that is actually a thing that i wanted to talk about is especially with scared straight as sort of this foundational band in what became a scene, uh, obviously, that we now know as Nardcore. But I'm always curious as to people involved in the early days of a scene like that. How, how early in that process do you realize exactly what's happening? You know what I mean? It, and maybe I ask questions like that because I come from New Hampshire and we didn't really have a scene, so to speak. We had a band or two here or there. But when you're when you're part of this, what ends up becoming this scene that has its own name for God's sake, and that produced a, a laundry list of of iconic bands, when do you realize that that's sort of a thing that's happening? Is it while you're in it, or is it when you're sort of distanced from those early days? Um, definitely when when it was starting. Um, you know, I was a little I was a little young for the for the late uh, late seventy punk surge in LA um, but you know when the early 80s came around and there was a lot of the hardcore bands you know the Black Flag, Circle Jerks, Adolescents, TSOL you know those, those staple bands we had in our area um, we started going to to gigs and you started meeting people from different communities there was the there was the 
the, the kids from the beach community down in Huntington Beach and Orange County, um, you know, the South Bay people, the Hollywood people. And, and, and there was a group of people from our area, uh, bands like Aggression, Dr. No, uh, bands that were a little on the, on the bigger side. And then when the, uh, the BYO comp came out, someone got their head kicked in and Aggression was on there. It kind of put us on the map. And I'd say they were probably the band at the forefront of the whole Nardcore scene. Yeah. And um, and uh, when we started going to gigs in other areas, you started uniting with like those local people just because you were from that area. And of course, in LA, there was always violence. And so, you know, it'd be the South Bay against this or LA against that. And there's all the other different types of gangs. But then locally, we had our own little cool thing going and we were just far enough from LA, I mean, 30, 40 miles, just far enough to where we could actually have a band that played in LA come to Ventura or come to Oxnard or come to Santa Barbara and play a gig on their way to San Francisco. So it kind of it kind of helped organize our own scene. And I'm not exactly, I've heard stories of how the name came about or, or when it came about, but I'm not exactly sure when the whole yeah. Nardcore thing came on the map officially. Um, but, uh, you know, we started having cool stuff like Sunday soccer games and barbecues. We'd have our own gigs and, and, uh, we had our own scene. So it, it, that's when I realized like, wow, you know, Nardcore is like a real thing. It's like, it's really our own scene. And then the bands that just started popping up and then the mystic record that came out somewhere around 84, just kind of officiated it and said, okay, well now it's an official type thing. Yeah. And, uh, and. And it kind of went from there, but definitely at the time, I knew that it was something for sure. And that it was something different than LA punk rock. I, I mean, I guess, like I said, growing up on the opposite coast, um, we sort of tended to lump, okay, LA is, I don't know, every band that's south of like the Bay Area, right? So, it, but then to realize once you actually learn more about the music and learn about the record labels and learn about all the different comps and whatever you're like no LA is so massive that there's all these little scenes uh without or, or throughout LA that are very different for sure um and and they popped up and some were you know some were they lasted for a few minutes some lasted for a few years um you know I think the one thing that that cemented the whole Oxnard thing was was the people and the and the positivity and the you know, the, I don't want to say there wasn't violence because there was at times still to do, but, but there was definitely a, com a smaller community feel and everybody kind of had each other's back. When I, when I think of like LA, you know, I'd always think of like boots and chains and spikes and studs. And when I, when I go to a show, you know, at home, you know, it was shorts and vans and t-shirts and it was kind of more that, 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 that scene. And um, so I don't want to say suburbia, but it was, it certainly wasn't like that core, like what you think of like an LA or a New York kind of hardcore scene. And um, it was, it was just the people that, that, that kind of, they were organized and, and, and took care of each other. And we were kind of like, I think we knew we had something special and we knew we had a lot of cool bands that were popular in the right. LA area. Right. So it, it kind of made us like worthy. We, we, we weren't just a scene with one band. There was, there was a, there was an Oxnard, there was a, Oxnard band or an hardcore band playing somewhere weekly throughout that period of time. So it was like, we were on the map. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like that's sort of what became the LA punk scene is I'm, I'm probably, I don't know, 10 years or so younger than you. Um, and what became, what we knew of LA punk was less to do with the black flags and TSOLs and those bands as the old LA hardcore bands. But what we knew of LA punk was essentially you guys or the lag wagons or face to faces or unwritten law, like the sort of skate punkery sound that that became California punk, at least, at least to us. But so it's interesting that that isn't necessarily what LA punk was at the beginning, but on a larger scale, that's what we associated LA punk with. So it seems like your scene kind of turned into what everybody knew as LA punk eventually. Yeah, I'm, uh, I think once the birth of, well, the birth of Epitaph was, yeah. you know, years and years ago, but I think when the, 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 the surge of, you know, no effects, Pennywise, um, 
you know, some of those earlier epitaph bands and then the fat labels started and they put Ladwagon on the map and face to face. And um, it became just kind of that general thing. Yeah, that was somewhere around the early mid nineties. Early nineties, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, that's kind of basically what it evolved into and it just continued to grow and get better in the style. It remained fast and energetic, but I think I think the musicianship got better and the songwriting got better and and uh, the players got better. And, and you know, the whole music genre itself went into a better direction. And, and um, you know, there's still, you still have the, you know, the, the crusty type punk scene. You still have the, you know, the, the hardcore bands, but, but that, that definitely overshadowed at that time, that whole skate, surf, snowboarding type, type uh, image along with the music. Um, did the, did the punkers ever give you shit for being a jock, for being a baseball guy, or was it not really that sort of divide? Well, before the advent of the internet, I, I didn't really, <laughs> you know, I didn't really hear anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, local people might have known, you know, guys in my band knew. Um, somewhere around the mid 90s or so, when the internet got pretty popular and, and we had done an epitaph record or two, it was, it was a question that was always brought up. Um, shit, I, I wouldn't say like, you know, shit. I don't think I was ever a jock. I, I you know, I was fortunate enough to, to play a professional sport for a living, um, but I, I certainly have never fit into the jock mentality. Um, what I would stereotype a jock yeah, as. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would always, I was very hesitant to try to, uh, to, to open up to, to either side yeah. when it came to, I didn't want to speak to the baseball people about music and I, cause they, they were clueless. And I really didn't want to speak to the music people about baseball because I felt like I'd be embarrassing the rest of the band by putting them in that situation. And, Oh, we got this professional baseball player. And, you know, it was like a bad thing. And then all of a sudden, I don't know when it was, but it became like a cool thing. And like, everybody started liking baseball, you know, all these guys I'd see on the road with, you know, tatted sleeves and, you know, just everything. They're just these baseball freaks. And it's like, wow, the world really changed over the yeah, course yeah. of the last 10, 15 years, you know? Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a combination of both, you know, I've, I've, I, I guess I, maybe I got a little shit at, at one point early on and, and, and then later on people were into it. So but it almost becomes like you, you become like this unicorn sort of like, Oh, he's a punk rock guy, but he likes baseball or the baseball guys are like, Oh, he's a baseball guy, but he's a punk rocker. Like, we don't know what that is. Like you're like, you're an exhibit in a zoo. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, especially for I, baseball I, writers, I'm sure. Yeah. They, they, they didn't really understand. For them, it was always a rock and roll band. It's Springsteen. You know, yeah. They like, yeah. at least here, it's sort of like notorious. The baseball writers are Springsteen heads for whatever reason, which is fine. Yeah. I like Springsteen, but like to a man they're they are Springsteen heads. Yeah. I could see that. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know. I've met a lot of, I met a lot of uh, musicians over the years that were huge baseball fans and a lot of, a lot of huge baseball fans that you know were musicians or yeah, yeah. vice versa you know why they all kind of want to do their own thing i it's just funny times have changed a lot you know i would have never thought like punk rockers would be playing golf yeah and, right. and you know night you know it's it's the world is what it is now right. i guess everything's okay do you miss playing baseball i know it's been a while since uh, you played played but do you miss being in and around the game every day or do you miss more being in and around punk rock shows every day especially now that you haven't been able to do either for the last year. Yeah. I mean, I, I miss, I miss both. Um, I, I've, I've stayed active literally in both, just not, I guess, publicly, um, you know, the baseball stuff, I, I help out a high school team. So I am around the field every day on a daily basis. Are they um, able to play and practice now and stuff like that? Yeah, they're playing and they practice. And um, there's a wood bat collegiate team out here in California, similar to the Cape Cod league. Yep. And um, I'm going to do, a, it's like a five week season. So we have like college kids that have come over from all around the country. Yep. They put them, put them up with host families and, and uh, it's a Southern California type thing. We go from central California to Orange County. I think the travel is like two hours and it's a, you know, six days a week baseball, you play home and home and away. Um, and then I think they have Mondays off, but it's a short season. It's like five weeks. So that's going to start for me 
uh, somewhere around mid June. Um, that's I don't great. know what the pro yeah I don't know what the protocols are. I'm sure we'll be wearing masks. We wear masks at the baseball field now at the high school, um, and then you know on the musical side of things, uh, I'm I'm thankful that we have these these bulk of songs that that we wrote, and I get to rehearse to those all the time on my own, um, you know. And and then uh, we've we've kind of got these releases coming out, which kind of keeps me active and things like this. Uh, you know, doing podcasts and interviews yeah. and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we have some shows booked uh, later in the year in October, November, and I, I feel pretty confident that they're going to happen. Uh, you know, we'll see um, if things keep trending in the right direction. I know the stuff we had overseas is probably definitely, I know it's not happening this year. Right. Um, but uh, like I said, we have some stuff later in the year and then hopefully it just kind of keeps going from there and, and then I'll get back to doing everything. Um, do you have a timeline for when you hope to get the new material recorded, the actual new, new material? Yeah, I think we're, we're looking at somewhere around the end of the year. And, uh, I personally, I know we have some stuff, uh, in May of next year where like we have some touring stuff. So it'd be ideal to have a new release come out, you know, some, sometime in early spring, maybe if possible. You know, to coincide with being able to play live, like for real. Yeah. yeah. You know, I can't wait because I think uh, no change in the weather for for a lot of people. If you don't know, no change in the weather was Pulley's last full length. It was what 2016, I guess, at this point. Mm -hmm. That was like a sleeper hit to so many people in the scene. Like it was like, oh shit, a new Pulley full length. Like, I don't really necessarily remember a huge build up to it coming out. It was like, oh. Polly's got a new album coming out this Friday. It's like, oh, awesome. And that album is so damn good. It's like, oh, oh cool. they didn't lose a damn thing off their fastball. And never mind, uh, not to make a baseball <laughs> analogy. <laughs> but man, that that's a good album. So it's uh I'm I'm excited for new material. Yeah, I'm glad you feel that way. Um, I, I, I don't know if we all felt the same. Um, you know, I know we wanted to put something out, it had been, you know, 12 years at that point. And, yeah. And um, you know. I, I like a lot of the songs. Uh, I'm really super excited about this this newer stuff. I think they're like I said, the, the fact that the three of us were together, yeah, and we we're kind of kind of dug in that foxhole for you know a good couple months. We really uh, we wrote some good music, and um, you know I know we were able to structure songs and and it just time to like most of the time I go in the studio, I don't really even have all the lyrics done and. You know, because everything's in such a rush, you know, and you're yeah, writing yeah. all the way up to the last minute. And and uh, and I'm sure we're going to continue to write music up until the end of the year when we go in the studio. Well, there'll be more songs that come. But but, uh, you know, to have like a, this bulk of songs, uh, I don't want to say finished, but like 95 percent of the way there. I feel like we're one step ahead and, and um, it, I'm, I'm excited about this. It's going to be good. I feel like the songs kind of hold their own. So I'm, I'm hoping it goes over. I can't wait. And hopefully we'll get to talk again then. Uh, I won't take up too much of your, I guess it's your morning, my afternoon. Uh, thank you for doing this. This is uh, this has been a lot of fun. And like I said, I've, I've been waiting to talk to you for a long time. Uh, as a longtime baseball fan and a longtime punk rock fan, this is this is the best of both worlds. Well, awesome, man. I, I appreciate it. I've been a super, I've been a long time dying scene fan. And you'd mentioned the, the website taking a shit about a year ago. I, I just remember one day, I, it's the first thing I would do every day. I'd be like, you know, dying scene and it would pop up on my phone. I would read and, and all of a sudden one day it just wasn't there. Yeah. Was like, what, what the hell? And then, so I went to the Facebook page and that's kind of been the same, the same yeah. screen forever. I haven't reached out to, to, to Dave yet, but I was wondering like, well, what, what happened to dying scene? And um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's good to see that at least there's some existence of it. It's, it's, it's a, it's a technical thing as much as anything. And it's that shit that's way over my head, Dave and Dave lives in South Africa. Now he's got a wife and a kid and a, like an important job and doesn't have the same amount of time that he did back in the, back in his California days to devote to it. And so it's really a matter of hoping at some point that somebody will like land in our laps and volunteer their <laughs> services to rebuild the site. So yeah. between this and the Dying Scene Radio podcast, we're trying to keep the flag, uh, you know, 
out there as much as possible. You're doing so it. The I mean, come back. You're doing it. Thank God yeah. for that. I know. I'm trying. Yeah. 